Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 98, we're going to take the first look at the prototype kit headphone amp. It's alive! Okay, but first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. So episode 100 is two weeks away and we're going to do a fun Q&A episode in which we answer your questions. Well, as many as we can get through anyways. The questions have been coming in every day and if you have something you wanted to have answered but were afraid to ask, go ahead and put it in the comments section below. Okay, so as you know, Charles has been working away on his prototype headphone amp, and this week, after hours of circuit adjustments, we ended up with an amp that has good specifications, and most importantly, it sounds great. Actually, I would say it sounds amazing. I'll let Charles tell you more about the design. Okay, so let's take a closer look at this thing. The first thing you'll notice is that this looks like a prototype. Uh, basically, we built the headphone prototype on an older prototype chassis just to make use of some parts and materials that we already had around. So this is far from the final form. The next thing you might notice is this gigantic hunk of iron right here. This is a Hammond uh, power transformer and it is essentially the starting point that goes into our a dual mono block system. That's right, we've got essentially two mono block amplifiers inside of here. This will feed two individual power boards and two individual filter sections as part of those power boards. And you can see it right here, we've got two chokes, two, chokes, two, two main filter caps. Two ma main filter caps, yep. Yeah. So think of this like two mono block amplifiers in one chassis and this transformer is powering it all, that's why it's so beefy. So Next thing you're going to notice are these leads coming off of here. Well, because we tried to fit it on this smaller chassis, we had nowhere to put the output transformers. So we built a little breakout box that these go to, and it's just off screen here somewhere. It's not very pretty and doesn't matter too much. So let's start talking about the tubes. These guys right here, let's get one up here. These are the 6P1P. And that is a Soviet output pentode similar to a 6V6 in spec. There's a nice Svetlana version. I think you can see the logo right there. I'll try and get it better in frame. So why don't you talk a little bit about the tube here? Well, you know, my, one of my favorite power tubes is the EL34, which is a, it's a pentode. So uh, pentodes have a particular sound to them. They're... They have a warmth to them that's hard to describe. That a 6v6, which is a beam-powered tetro, it, it has its own unique sound, but it doesn't have that mid-range warmth the way pentodes do. So mm -hmm. when I found the Svetlanas um, available in quantity, Newell stock, you know, uh, bulk vintage, just beautiful looking tubes waiting for somebody to design something for them, I knew right away we had to use them. And they've been such a great tube to work with too. We've like most of the design steps, these things haven't given us any trouble at all. They've been fantastic and they sound great. And of course we're running them triode strapped because we're in pure class A and we're getting, I believe, 1.75 watts out of this amp right now, which should be more than enough to drive pretty much everything out there. And what have you got for a driver to? Okay, so that's where things get really interesting here. The eagle-eyed among you will have probably spotted these beautiful 12 AU7 RCA clear tops in the driver stage right now. So these have been sounding great. Uh, they're clear, they've got a nice warm mid-range, uh, the detail is just fantastic, although I guess we can probably say that about everything here. But they're probably one of the best made, North American made 12 AU7s ever. Right? Exactly, yeah. So that wasn't a surprise. So. We've got a 12AU7 in the driver's stage, but we have other options. This is the 6N1P. This particular one is the EV version, which I believe is mil-spec. 
and I don't know if you can make out the logo there. Let me try and get a little closer. So this is the Voshkod rocket version. You can see the little rocket logo right here. And what this is, is it's something between a 12AU7 and a 6DJ8. Has similar specs to both, doesn't quite perform like either of them, but it runs just fine in this amplifier. And this is... Well, it's more than just fine. Oh, more than just fine. It gives the clear tops a run for their money, if not... Uh, I would say it's in the same league as the clear tops. Absolutely, yeah. It's different though. It's not the sound is different, and we're going to have to do an episode just on tube rolling, maybe two or three. <laughs> yeah, once, maybe two once, or three. Once we have a production version ready. So that's the second tube we can run as a driver. That's right. I said second. Here's the third. So we just mentioned the six DJ eight, and what we have here is a Toshiba. M3624, which is just an industrial rated version of a 6DJ8. And these are the actual tubes that we've been rolling and listening to. These are the right. actual tubes that we've been rolling, and this uh, this amp will play all of these tubes, and there's more. And the 6DJ8 was no slouch. It, it sounded amazing as well. So here we have the 6CG7, and this is actually the direct equivalent to a 6SN7 in a 9-pin format. A lot of people think it's the 12AU7. They're close, but they're not quite the same. But this will run in the circuit just fine. And more than just fine, it sounds great as well. Yeah, I know we keep saying that, but it's, it's hard to describe these any different. Then we have another tube, the 12BH7. This is a just fantastic Sylvania example with these black rounded plates. This actually is a lot closer to a 12AU7, and you're, you'll see people rolling them in 12AU7 um, positions and amplifiers. And that was one of your favorites, wasn't it? That was one of my favorites. The, the responsiveness of it, I think, got me. But as, I, as we've been saying, everything just sounds really great. And one more tube. So for anybody that's counting out there, we're up to six here now. So far. So far. This is the 6N6P, which is another Soviet dual triode. And you'll more commonly see these guys in output, amp uh, in output sections for output transformerless amplifiers. But they also have a mu of 20 and can be used in the driver stage as a preamp. And wow, I was doing, I did my first long listening session last night. Uh, I put on um, uh, a concert by Anwar Braham and the recording has an amazing resolution and i i just couldn't believe the things i was hearing a lot of uh, little cues that i've never heard before in the recording this stops of the bass clarinet um, little plucks of the string little tiny uh, resonances that you just can't hear unless you've got high high resolution and th the sound was just coming out of this dark black background yeah, uh, all all of that detail was just coming right through, and we, we had trouble stopping listening to it last night. We worked late last night listening to this thing. So what's next, Charles? I mean, we've put two intense weeks into this. In fact, right. we're, we got behind on some other work. Well, yeah, we got a bit behind, but the good news is, is that we've got the circuit working. The amp sounds absolutely amazing, and we're happy with how it's performing. So the next step is making it look beautiful. So I'm going to start working on the design of the chassis, which is going to be vertical in concept uh, to try and save space on desks or side tables, things like that. And um, hopefully we're going to have some updates for you on that in the, in the coming days. And our biggest problem right now is we can't come up with a working design name. <laughs> oh, that's I, I, right. I think you called it the Eiffel. Well, we were thinking about Eiffel. We're not so sure about that, but no. we're, we're open to suggestions for it. Somebody's got a name for, if you remember what the the rough sketch um, concept that Charles came up with, yeah. oh, a month or more that, ago. That swoopy side design, yeah. Yeah, a vertical, a vertical standing amp. Um, uh, put it in the comment section. We'd love to know what, we, we need some help. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're not coming up with a name yet. And the other thing you're gonna do is you're gonna do some dedicated videos on the Melatone Kit channel. That's right, so we're gonna take a closer look on that channel at the schematics for this amplifier and some frequency sweeps that we've already gone through and discuss some of the really interesting features that we've been able to integrate into this. Yeah, so if you're interested in uh, following along what Charles is gonna talk about, we'll put a link below to the Melatone Kit channel. 
and um, I promise you there's no advertising. Well, sometimes, unfortunately, YouTube... I, here's a funny story. I, I, won't, I won't bore you for too long, but I get recommendations from YouTube, and they've started recommending my videos, um, but the annoying thing is that I have to test videos quite often, and I was doing a test of a video, and the little buggers put advertising on my test. So, so that's not intentional. It's no. just YouTube doing what they're doing. Yeah, our channel is totally unmonetized, but YouTube reserves the right to make money off of our free content. Figure that one out. Anyways. Yeah, feel free to skip it if you can. <laughs> yeah. So th we've been telling you for weeks now that thousands of tubes are coming in. Well, thousands of tubes have come in and will continue to come in. We've put a lot of orders in and we've got a lot of really amazing stuff to show you. So, Charles, you want to clear the deck? Yeah, let's get this heavy guy out of the way. So, let's, let me just grab everything over here. I've got a really special unboxing for you. And we will start over here. A whole bunch of GE 6SN7 GTBs, new in the box, new old stock came in and let me just see if I can find my knife. There you go. Oh, thank you. I'm just going to take a quick peek at these and see if we can get them out without doing any damage. Now, the G is kind of a I can do everything well and nothing great tube. Um, and what I use them most often for is in the cathode follower slot. They're really a rock solid tube and they seem to like the follower stage. And But they're no slouch as a voltage gain amplifier. So you can put these, let's say in the Freya, which has a voltage gain stage and a follower stage. You could put these in the front, especially a new old stock tube and they would sound great. Up next we've got a Sylvania 6SN7 GTB and this is a very interesting tube. This has a red uh, number and a red label. Let me show you. Now, finding a lot of new old stock tubes, new in the box, just doesn't happen much anymore, especially high demand tubes like the Sylvanias. Look at that red label. So. I didn't know what the heck a red label was on these tubes until I talked to one of our suppliers and he told me that Sylvania ran a jobbers program. So how it worked was if you were a tech or a repairman back in the day, you could sign on to this program and they would give you uh, bulk tubes at a heavy discount. But they were red labeled and you could never bring them back for a cash refund if you had a problem or needed a replacement. What you did was you went back to your wholesaler, you brought in your bad tube, your red label tube, and you got a replacement red label. So that's why some of the Sylvanias are specifically red labeled. I don't think they ran that program before 1960 because um, I've never seen the early 1950s tubes with red labels. Anyways, that's just an aside. The Sylvania 6SN7s, in my opinion, are in the top three sounding 6SN7s ever made. There's a whole series of them from the GT to the GTA to the GP, GTB. But in, in general terms, they all have that warm, rich Sylvania house sound. That's what I like to say anyways. Uh, and the 6SL7 is the same. It has a very similar sonic profile. Now, tongue saw, as you know, is in the top one, two, or three slot as well. And the difference between the tongues and the Sylvanias is that the, the tongues have a level of depth of detail that just continues to go on and on and on, almost to infinity. You give up a little bit of the warmth of the Sylvania tube and you get a little bit more detail. These Sylvanias are no slouch when it comes to details, but the tongues I love these boxes, aren't they? They're, they're just, they're so cute. <laughs> um, and have a look at this. These are the tall boys. And these are new old stock as well. And they are probably the rarest of the high demand tubes that I deal with in on a regular basis. 
Um, I probably find as many Mullard XF2 EL34s, new old stock, as I find these. And these are just in perfect shape. And used, we found a whole bunch of Sylvania 6SN7 GTAs. So this is an earlier version. This is between the first low-spec version, the GT, that came out in the 1940s. It was first released in the late 30s, but it was very popular in the, in the 40s. In the 1950s, the GTA took over with a higher spec. These are not sexy looking tubes. They're pugly, but they had big chrome domes. Not You can really recognize these by the large chrome dome. And the earlier the GTA, the more chrome. <laughs> and these are amazing. They probably have the nicest detail of all the Sylvanias, but they're getting rare and they are expensive. So a whole bunch of these came in used. And I saved the best for last. Now, this is a number 76 tube, but it's in a very special packaging. And the one we opened up was actually for the US Air Force. And I think what this packaging is meant to do is to preserve the tube in a safe state so that it can be a immediate spare on the spot. You know for sure, you open it up, it's tested, it's ready to go, and um, the packaging helps keep it safe as well. So maybe it would have actually been airborne or you know, in a situation where it's, it's actually possibly in a combat zone. Um, I'm not 100% certain. Somebody can jump in and help us. So this, this has not been opened since what year did we have on that? These were 1952? 54. Uh, Let me get 54. that on camera. October the 18th. No, imagine that. October the 18th, 1954. Yep. So that's that's almost 70 years it's been sitting in that bag. And I had the nerve to open it up. Um, and it's the tape's a little sticky. Let's see if we can get the tube out of there. Everything is kind of old and ready to fall apart here. You see that really soft wrap on a lot of these older military tubes, though, and it's actually quite nice. Yeah. It really, if it wasn't for the tape, it would probably be really easy to pull off here. Yeah, it really cradles the tube gently. It's, it's sort of like the, it's the natural version of what we, you know, use as bubble wrap today would be the equivalent, let's say, of, of that. Let's get a little bit. Of, see, it's got a little bit of dirt on it. That'll come off easily with the white. So what have we got? So it's a 76 with a large amount of waste chrome. And this is branded tongue cell, but I think Charles knows these tubes. Is that a real tongue cell, Charles? I think that actually is. It's a real tongue cell. Wow, so that's a fine. Now the last one we opened up was a... It was an RCA. It was an RCA. And interestingly, the RCA had been second tested at the factory before being shipped to the military. They had even marked a second set of test numbers on it and an OK to make sure it was it was good to go. Yeah, that's right. They used a white grease pen mm -hmm. to mark it up all the way up the side here, I think. And this one doesn't have a testing note. Nope. But it was probably packed under contract and the contract probably stated it needed to meet a minimum, you know, high high testing mark before it could be packed. Anyways, well, that that's really exciting. Um, and if you stayed all the way till the end, We've got some discount codes to help you out. Remember, we've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping is on us. And of course, all of our standard codes apply. And there's one hidden secret code that's easy to figure out. No more hints, though. I've been giving away too many. I've been giving away a lot of money <laughs> for the people who've guessed the last code. Anyways, stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim and Charles signing off. Cheers, everyone.